God says it, do we believe it? When God says it in, in your life, do we believe it? I don't know if that's God already at work in this place. Or... <laughs> I did eat this morning. It's not my stomach growling. Acts, we're in the book of Acts. We're starting a new series this morning. If you missed any of the Jesus and Genesis series, you can ch- catch up online either on YouTube or on our website. But today we start a new series called Sent. Sent. So we look at the book of Acts, not A X, A C T S, the book of Acts. The book of Acts, the Acts of the church. Book of Acts of the the church, the early church. It's the beginning of the church. If you have a Bible, you can open it up to the book of Acts. First book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. First book after the Gospels. So you can turn there or you can follow along on the, the screen or on your device, whatever you have there. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. In the first book, all right, what's the first book? Genesis? No. In the first book, who's the author of the book of Acts? The author of the book of Acts is a man named Luke. Luke was a, was a doctor. He wrote two books in the New Testament. The first book that Luke wrote was Luke. This is, he's referring to his first book that he wrote. And Luke is known as being very detailed. Why? Because he's, he's a doctor. Details matter. You want somebody operating on you who is concerned with details, right? So he writes a second book. This second book, Book of Acts, is he's writing to a specific person, Theophilus. Theophilus. Now, we believe that Theophilus was a skeptic, right? Not somebody who is a follower of Jesus. What, what do we know about Luke just from this first? Right? Luke had friends who didn't know Jesus, do you have friends who do not know Jesus? Uh, for those of you who get the newsletter on a weekly basis, I touched on this this, this past week. And, and just a little side note, now every week on our website, we have some members of our church writing articles. There's a new article posted there every week. So thank you for the article writing team that is attributing uh, and teaching us God's word through those, those articles. But Theophilus, A skeptic. We don't know a whole lot more about Theophilus than that. He was a skeptic. So Luke is writing to him to appeal to him. Now, usually when I come across somebody who doesn't know Jesus or they're early in their walk, we usually say, read the book of John. Tends to be the first book. We want somebody who may not be familiar with God's word or new to their walk with Christ or may not even know Jesus. Hey, read the book of John. But Acts was actually written to a skeptic. We believe that Theophilus was a Roman centurion, Roman soldier, high up, had a lot of influence, and Luke is writing to him. So he says in the first book, O Theophilus, uh, the most excellent Theophilus, so someone of, of great position, of great influence, of great power. Now there's some other thoughts on who Theophilus is. One is he's a Roman lord, and actually there's a Theophilus who actually funds Paul's missionary journeys later on. So there's some belief that this is a Theophilus. The third belief is that Theophilus is a, is a Jew. And Theophilus is a Greek name, so I'm going to go with and persuade you that he is a Roman centurion, although, bottom line, we don't know exactly who he is, other than he's a skeptic. So Luke is writing to him, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach in his first book. The book of Luke, the gospel, one of the four gospels. I'm writing to you about what Jesus began to do. Is that all that Jesus did? No. He began to do it in Luke. Now what, what, do, we, what do we know about the book of Acts? He's not done yet. Jesus is not done. Jesus is still at work. He didn't stop working when he ascended into heaven. Luke's now going to write the book of Acts. It's going to say what else Jesus began to do and teach. Until the day when he was taken up. After that, he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. 
He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs. Now, do you hear this? He's writing to a skeptic, someone who may not believe. So he's giving him proof. Appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Now, what the book of Acts is going to teach us is all about the beginning days of the church. The very beginning of the church. The church. You and I are part of the church. Now, what's interesting, over the years, over the centuries, the word church has taken on a different meaning, right? Not the word that it was originally intended to be used. Originally, when I was a child, they taught me this in Sunday school. I don't know if anybody else ever learned this. Here's the church. Here's the steeple, right? Wrong. The church is not a building, right there. I was taught that. Now, I remember it. Church is not a building, right? Now, the second half of this is accurate. Here's the church. My fingers don't work like they used to. Here's the steeple. Open the doors and see all the people, right? Does anybody, anybody know what I'm talking about here? You're <laughs> looking at me like, this guy is crazy. The church is not a building. The church is a group of people. The original word was ekklesia in, in Greek. It was an assembly. It's a gathering of, of people. But we use it as a location, don't we? Are we going to church today? What time is, is church? We're using it as, so often as a location. I'm on my way to, to church. When, when church services, right? So not what was originally intended. So much so, William Tyndale in the 16th century, because already by the 16th century, this word in German, it was translated to church. Church. Church isn't really an English word. It's, we took it from the German word church. You can hear the resemblance there, which was defined as a location, as an institution. Jesus never intended for the church to be an institution. The church is a movement. And what do movements do? Movements move. If you're taking notes, in the future we're going to have fill in the blanks. How excited are you about that? <laughs> Starting next week. Feedback, I heard it. Feedback, you guys like fill in the blanks. We're going to do that beginning next week. But if you're taking notes, two words, really deep this morning. It's Labor Day. It's a holiday weekend, so we're not going to go real deep. Movements move. Movements move. Churches that do not move die. Movements come and go. Except the church. The church is a movement that you and I get to be a part of. Now there's the Big C Church, which is the universal church, which includes every person who's ever given their life to Jesus, you're part of the universal church. Big C church. In fact, the word Catholic has a different meaning today, but years ago, Catholic simply meant universal. So we're Catholic purists, right? We're part of the Catholic Big C church. Now, some of you are getting uncomfortable when I say that, but the original word Catholic meant we're all part of the Catholic church, universal global church, the body of Christ, Big C. It's a good thing. And then there's the, the small C, the, the local church. And the local church, we're told in Revelation, every local church has, has a, a candle. No local church is meant to last forever. So local churches come and go. Uh, Revelation tells us uh, local churches have their, their flame eventually goes out. The, the seven churches in Revelation that John writes to, they don't exist as they existed back, back then, right? Small churches come and go. But we are part of the movement of the big C church, movements. And then we can speak about Boulder Mountain and to make sure we're moving. Because if we're not moving, eventually we will die. If we're not doing things that we've never been done before, if we're not starting new things and doing new things to reach people who've never been reached before, then eventually we're, we're going we're going to die. Movements move. But let me go back to the 16th century. William Tyndale, when he translated the Word of God into English for the first time, he wanted to really make sure that this word 
was translated correctly. And so every time the word ecclesia was, he used the word congregation. And this was so radical that he was tried as a heretic. He was hanged. He died by hanging. If that wasn't enough, then he was burned at the stake. And before he is put to death, his whole idea and his whole goal was that every person would have a copy of God's word. I know it's a radical idea, isn't it? For us, we might take that for granted, but back then, the average layperson did not own a copy of God's word. They relied only on those who priests in the, as we would understand, Catholic Church. I'm really confusing you now, Ron. So he says before he, his life is taken, he says, if God spares my life or protects my ministry, I pray that the boy who drives the plow to know more of the scriptures than you do. His final words, before he is hung, he says, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. Now, many of us in the room today, maybe our very first English Bible might have been the King James Version of the Bible. That was, that was the prayer of William Tyndale, the King of England. This is an important concept. The church is not a building that you and I come and sit in. It, over the years, it's become this idea of an institution where we provide religious services. And I'm sorry if that's the idea that you have when it, you think of a, a church. A church is so much more than that. Should churches provide services for its congregation? Yes, absolutely. Programs and, and ministries, yes. But it's, if that's all we are, we're going to die a lot sooner than any of us would like. The church should be doing things that have never been done before to reach people who've never been reached before. Now, we can't do everything. There's going to be some things that we choose not to do. But in the next year, we're going to, as we plan for 2024, we're going to do some things that we've never done before as a church to reach people who've never been reached before. We begin a series looking at the church. Verse 6, while staying with them, Jesus staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized me with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord... Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So a few things from this first section of Acts. Get the first picture of, of the church. Now, the Holy Spirit has not come yet. And so Jesus says, I would need you to wait here. And they're standing there talking to Jesus. And Jesus ascends to heaven. He tells them, don't go anywhere until the gift is sent to you. And then Jesus, kind of a crazy passage, right? If you, You're just standing there talking to Jesus. And what are they concerned about? What's the question that they ask? When are you, this is the question they had before Jesus goes to the cross. We're looking for you to be a, a political figure, Jesus. When are you going to restore Israel? When are you going to be the king of Israel? Okay, he goes to the cross. They scatter. They run away. Jesus defeats death. He resurrects again. And then now they're following him again. They still have the same question. When are, when are you going to restore Israel? Some of us have that question today. We're looking around. When are you going to restore America to be great again? Some of us, that's a legitimate question. We're distracted by the movement of the church, the movement of the, the gospel. What's the other thing that they're doing? As Jesus ascends into heaven, they stand there looking up. They're looking up. 
And then there's two figures there, two, two angels sh show up. They say, why are you looking into heaven? Second, second thing, just real quick from this passage. Uh, it is really easy to spend a lot of time thinking about when Jesus is returning. Is it important to study that? Yes. We're to study scripture. And we're to study revelation. And we're to, uh, to the best of our ability, understand the times that we're living in. If that's all we're doing, we're missing the movements that's currently happening. If, if we're so focused on when Jesus is returning that we're not loving our neighbor, not reaching our neighbor, not praying to reach this community, then we're missing the movement of the church. Why are you standing there looking up? We're told here in this passage, as in other passages, no one knows. Are we to study about end times and have good eschatology? Eschatology is the word meaning our end times convictions. What do you believe about the end times? And I have some strong convictions about the end times, and I'll be happy to have those conversations with you. Do not let that be a priority. Do not let that overtake your love for your neighbor and the love for the people around you and the people God's placed in your life. Don't spend so much time that you're heavenly minded and you're no of no earthly good. You ever heard that phrase before? We're so heavenly minded, we're of no earthly good. Now, some of you are, you, right now, as I'm talking about this, you're getting a little, uh, you're feeling it. Because aren't we supposed to, uh, during COVID, every church in America did like a 38-week series on Revelation, right? And uh, good, have studies on Revelation. But don't let that be the primary focus and drive of your life. And you ignore the people who don't know Jesus all around you. Why are you standing there looking up in heaven? Listen, it's, it's always good to believe that Jesus is coming back today. You, you can't go wrong if you live your life as though Jesus is coming back today. Here's my conviction on it. And I'd love to have a conversation with you, and I can, I can share about end times and kind of where I land on that. But I, I thought about it. God didn't ask me to be part of the planning team. God didn't invite me to that committee to plan when Jesus is returning. Did he invite you to that? He hasn't included me in on that. In fact, he hasn't included any of us in on that. He's invited me to be part of the welcoming committee, not the planning committee. And the same is true for you, and the same is true for our church. We're, we're to preach that Jesus is returning the end of service today, we're having communion. Communion is looking back at the cross, but the second half of communion is looking forward to the return of Jesus. But that's not to be our number one focus every day. Right? What's the greatest commandment? To love God, with our, love God, and love our neighbor. Love people. Love God and love people. Needed to share that today. The church, it's good to study our Bibles. It's good to have studies on Revelation. It's good to study about the end times. But that shouldn't be our only focus. Why? Because the church is a movement. And what, what do movements do? Movements move. Basically what the disciples are asking Jesus. Jesus, before he leaves, what's your next move? Jesus, what, what are you going to do next? All right? I mean, you defeated death. What's, what's the encore here? What, what are we going to expect next? And do you know what Jesus says? You are my next move. Uh, me and, and you are his next move. How do you feel about that? Jesus is like, my work here is done. I'm out. It's time for you. Boggles my mind when I think about this passage. There are passages that tell us more work is going to be done when Jesus leaves than was done when he was here. You are to be my witnesses. You. I Read this passage, put your name in there. Put your personal name in this passage. You 
are to be his personal witness. Now, what's a witness? I can't witness and I can't testify unless I speak. Testify, right? You and I don't have to do anything. We have to speak to what's already been done. Does this make sense? Testify, if you were to take an oath and go into court and sit before a jury and you're asked to testify, you actually have to say something. Right? Now, what are some of the excuses that we come up with? Well, I let my, my life be a testimony. Okay, that's good. It's good to be nice to people. It's good to buy people coffee and to be kind to people. Let your life be a light, and that's good. Your, your behavior should, should be an example to other people. But what we're told, and we're told to testify, means we actually have to use words to testify to the work of Jesus and what he's done in your life. When was the last time you shared what God has done in your life, the transforming work and power that he's done in your life? When have you testified about that to someone else? I know this is stretching us. It's stretching me as well. To testify, speak. Now, there's a saying, St. Francis of Assisi, that gets quoted a lot. Wherever you go, preach the gospel. If necessary, use words. Anybody ever heard that? That's a nice saying. But to testify means you actually have to speak. You, you actually have to talk about Jesus and the work of, of Jesus in your life. And some of us have excuses like, well, I don't have the gift of evangelism. Has anybody ever thought that or said that? There are people much better than, than me at that. But the mandate and the call is for each and every one of us. We're all to testify. To be, to be a witness. You and I are not salespeople. All right? If you've ever felt the pressure you had to win someone to Jesus, let me relieve that pressure from you. That's not your job. That's not my job. We don't save anybody. We don't have the power to save anyone. But we're, we're not salespeople, but we, tell, we should be telling a story. And we should be testifying to the power of Jesus in our life the power of Jesus, what Jesus has done. Can you testify to the power of Jesus in your life? When was the last time you had a, had a conversation with someone? The challenge with, with church life and making, when we view church as an institution and church has all these programs and I feel like I have to be at the church every night of the week, and every, every time there's something I feel guilty and I have to sign up, listen, if we do that, do you know who gets left out? People who don't know Jesus get left out. You have permission from me as your pastor to say no to a church event, to say no to a church program, so that there's margin in your life for you to be around people who don't know Jesus. Sometimes we get so busy at the church and the church as an institution that we lose sight of the people who don't know Jesus. Where are you going in your life? What environments are you intentionally showing up into where you're hanging around people who don't know Jesus? It's a challenge for some of us. It's a challenge for me. I work at the church. I'm around church people all the time. Pray for me. I have to be really intentional to go places to hang around people who don't know Jesus. It's healthy. It's good. Jesus, what was he called? A friend of sinners. I know there's sinners in church. Go places where you have hobbies, you have interests, you have skills. Go, go places where people who, won't, who are not here today, where they're hanging out. What does that look like in your life? Where can you go to testify to the power of Jesus in your life? Don't be awkward. Don't be weird about it. Right? Bullhorns don't work anymore on street corners. Personal relationships work. People are longing for community. They're longing for friends. They're longing for people to notice them and know their name and ask them how they're doing. Ask, really ask them, how are you doing? 
And in that conversation, you begin to, to share about the life-changing work of Jesus in your life. And this isn't about Boulder Mountain Church. This is about you having an opportunity to, to testify to the power of Jesus in your life. And when appropriate, Invite them to a church service. Look for opportunities. We have live nativity at the end of the year. It's a great opportunity to invite a neighbor, a coworker, to have a, an opportunity to engage, engage with the church. There are other events throughout the year. Opportunities for us to, to engage with people who don't, know, who don't know Jesus. Some movements move. Are you a part of the movement? Let me ask you, are you a part of the movement how are you engaging in the movement of God? It's the greatest movement that's ever been given, that's ever existed in the history of the world. The greatest assignment that's ever been given was given to the most unqualified group of people, a group of fishermen, tax collectors, tax cheats, carpenters, that had failed their assignment up to this point. In every possible way, they failed. And Jesus gives them the greatest assignment that the world has ever known. He's like, I'm out. Now, a couple of things about the church. This is plan A. You are plan A. How do you feel about that? And there's no plan B. And every church is really one generation away from extinction. That's why our student ministries and our children's ministries are so important in the life of Boulder Mountain, to reach the next generation. We're only one generation away from, from the church being extinct. And thank you to many of you who serve in kids' classrooms, and uh, they're not hearing that because they're back there in, in the kids' classrooms. A number of you next week, when we go to two services, you now have an opportunity to serve one service and to a, attend a, another service. Thank you. For those of you who've, who've answered that call to serve our, our kids. Movements, movements move. And Jesus gives the greatest assignment to the least qualified group of people ever. What, what am I talking about that? Uh, let me talk about prophets. John the Baptist, according to Jesus, is the greatest prophet He's actually, he's not a New Testament prophet. He's really not an Old Testament prophet, right? He kind of is in between. He precedes Jesus. He's the forerunner to Jesus. But Jesus calls him the greatest prophet. Matthew 11, 11. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Now listen to this. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. What's Jesus saying there? The least in the kingdom. Now, there's some of us are thinking, uh, man, I have nothing to give in the movement of the church. I am the least. I'm the most unqualified. I have no talents. I have no gifts. There's probably somebody in this room already thinking that. I've got nothing to give. Either my age disqualifies me or my skills or my health. I have nothing to give. Listen, the words of Jesus say, you are greater than John the Baptist. I'm not making that up. Jesus says it. The least in the kingdom will be greater than John the Baptist. Now, what's, what's the difference maker? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, and you're going to be my witnesses. You're going to testify of the work of Jesus in your life. The Holy Spirit. How was your life different this week because of the power of the Holy Spirit? How was your life different? What, what did the Holy Spirit ask you to do? How were you led by the Holy Spirit? Who did you talk to because of the Holy Spirit moving in your life this week? We don't talk about the Holy Spirit a whole lot. The power of the Holy Spirit, that same power that rose Jesus from the dead, lives inside of you, and you will be the witnesses of the work of Jesus as you go throughout your week. You'll be the witness in your family, in your marriage, with your kids, in your community, in your neighborhood, you will testify. And that testimony will be greater than the testimony that John the Baptist had. Are you kidding me? Right there. 
The person who's saying, I've got nothing to give. That's the very person that Jesus wants to do a movement. I believe, I am convinced, as I started studying the book of Acts and the series, I believe that someone's life God's going to get a hold of in our church community. There's going to be a significant step of faith as we go through this series. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know who that is. Last week, we had an opportunity to send a missionary out. That was our first. That will not be our last missionary that we send out. Why? Because we're a movement. We are part of a movement. What do movements do? Movements move. We're going to be doing things we've never done before Boulder Mountain. And that's, that's making some of us a little nervous. Uh, going to two services, like, oh, you're splitting up the church. <laughs> I get it. I feel it. Right? I, that's why that community time in between services is going to be so important. You, don't leave until you see your friend coming from that next service, right? You'll, you'll still be able, able to interact. It's not about us. It's not about you. It's not about me. We know Jesus. If you know Jesus, your eternity is secure. If you don't know Jesus, I am so glad you're here. Jesus says, stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. The Holy Spirit has come. You and I, we don't need to stay here anymore. Right? Jesus says, the Holy Spirit's going to come. You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Mesa. You're going to be my witnesses in Mesa, in your neighborhood, in your HOA, in your community. You're going to be my witnesses there. But not just in Mesa, in the state of Arizona, in Jerusalem, in Judea. It's kind of the circle that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then he says Samaria. Samaria. Those people. That, those group of people that they, Jews didn't even travel through Samaria. Remember, Jesus goes through Samaria, meets the woman at the well. He didn't walk around Samaria. He goes through Samaria. You're going to be my witnesses in, in enemy territory. You're going to be a witness of Jesus and the work of Jesus to different cultures, different groups of people not like you. We need to be around people like us, and we need to be around people who are, where are you going that make you uncomfortable? Where are the locations and places that you're going that stretch you? Where you walk in the room, you're like, I am so uncomfortable right now. Go there this week. Okay? To be a testimony. Testify. I mentioned last week, I had an opportunity to bring some school supplies over to our local school here around the corner. And this week, I had a conversation with the principal, just praying. God, I asked for an open door. And we get to bring breakfast to uh, this local school, Zaharis school on Thursday morning. We get to show up there and we get to bless 40, 50 teachers and just say, we're here in the neighborhood. We're for you. Thank you for what you're doing. We know being a teacher is really hard, right? This is an opportunity that we have to bless because God's been so good to us. We get to bless this school. It's an opportunity. Go places. So often as a church, we expect people to come here. Come to the church. Actually, the message is we go to them. We're to be sent. You're to go. Let's not wait for them to show up here. Yeah, extend an invitation when appropriate. But let's, let's go. And let's testify. Speak of the life change of what's been done in your life. Uh, finally, I, I leave you with this. Matthew 16. And Jesus answered him, speaking to Simon, Peter. Blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. When you think of gates, what do you think of? Are gates an offensive or defensive structure? They're defensive. Who's on the offense? College football just started this weekend. I'm speaking somebody's language right now, right? Yeah, there's a couple. <laughs> offense or defense? Is the church on the defense or the offense? Unfortunately, many churches are on the defense. They're keeping people out. The church should be on the offense. The gates of hell are a defensive structure. 
The gates of hell will not stand against the church when it's on the move. There's been no greater movement in the history of the world. Movements come and go all the time. You see it all the time. Things rise and fall. Nations come and go all the time. Trends come and go all the time. The church will last. You and I have the opportunity to be part of the greatest movement in the world. What's your part in it? What is God asking you? What's the role? What's the, the part? Is he asking you? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, real quick, and I'll end with this, the Holy Spirit. All throughout the book of Acts and the Gospels, we see when the Holy Spirit comes upon someone, life change happens. Elizabeth, being filled with the Spirit in Luke 141, proclaims a blessing over Mary. Zechariah in Luke 167, being filled with the Spirit, prophesied about the coming glory of Jesus. In Acts 2.4, the Holy Spirit fills the apostles at Pentecost, they begin to declare God's praises in multiple languages. In Acts 4.8, Peter is filled with the Spirit and preaches to the rulers that Jesus is their only hope of salvation. Acts 4.31, the disciples are filled with the Holy Spirit and they speak the word of God. They speak the word of God boldly in the face of severe persecution. Acts 9.20, Paul is filled with the Spirit and he immediately begins to preach in the synagogue. You can go through the book of Acts and you can highlight and the Holy Spirit shows up. Listen, if you've given your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. The Holy Spirit dwells within you and gives you power. You're like, I don't know what to say. Sometimes God's asking you to show up, to walk into that room. He will give you the words to say. The Holy Spirit will give you what you need to say. As we, as we prepare our hearts for communion, which we'll take in, here in just a moment, let, would you pray with me? God, as we begin this series, I, I ask that we would all have a conviction here this morning to testify of the work that you've done in our life. That we would speak boldly, be confident. We wouldn't be timid about the faith and the hope that we have in us. I pray that you would speak to each and every person in this room about our role, about being part of the movement, what that looks like, and how we can, how we can commit to testify and being part of this, this movement. Thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to be a light, to reach Jerusalem, Judea, and, and Samaria, and what that looks like here in Mesa. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.